Yeah. Good. Well, uh, welcome, Ian Cairns, to the Boardroom Podcast. It's good to see you, buddy. Yeah, thank you. It's uh, it's interesting. Um, are you able to run a boardroom show anytime soon, or? Yeah, that's the hopes are we're going to, well, we are doing it in October, the 9th and 10th of October. By then, um, we feel confident that the vaccine will have run through the community and most of us will be more or less safe. And um, people are pent up, they're ready to get back to life. And and I think we're gonna be on a good, good path. Well, I sure hope so because it's been a really important part of the core surf community. Um, you know, the whole shaping thing and the surfboard thing has been, been going bananas because of COVID. So there's more surfers than ever. I think it's really, it's a huge positive for surfing. Yeah, I agree. And thank you. Thank you, Ian. Yeah, we're looking forward to getting it going again. And this year we'll be honoring Pat Rawson as our icon <laughs> of foam. And um, nice. it'll be good fun. It'll be fun. It's always a good time. Yeah, he's... Uh, been around a long time he makes some really good performance stand-up surfing boards too by the way are you um I've, i'm i'm curious about the concept of surfing and and aging because i'm getting to that place in my life where i'm finding myself stumble when i try to take off and i don't have my uh the agility that i once had as a young guy and um how did that how did you did you struggle with that how, what was it like for you when you realized you know what i'm, I'm you know, explain a little bit of that to me, Ian, if you well, will. Well, there, there, there were multiple things. Um, I, I've had lots of injuries, uh, particularly my shoulders. And so if you can't push up quickly and jump to your feet and, and get the edge in, you've missed the moment on a wave. And so because I'm bigger, like I'm 6'2 and, you know, 235, um, you got a power to weight ratio differential that's somewhat different to what it was when I was 20. And so you, you're losing agility, you're losing your quickness, your, uh, my shoulders, I had a bad snowboarding accident and I had to have shoulder surgery. So I was out for a long time and two of my rotator cuffs on the right side, the muscles could not be, you know, replaced. So I have torn bicep tendons in both arms. I have a partial tear in the rotator on my left shoulder. So I have all of this sort of residual injury stuff that slows you down. I don't have that same pop and launch. And then I found myself, and I didn't realize, you know, we're, we're paddling and as we get up, we're parallel with the board, but you actually have to rotate your body to get your front foot in front of the back foot. And so I found myself popping up parallel and I'm just going, and then I'm going over the falls. My thing was always, I could make any late takeoff. Right. And so now you've got these physical injuries that are affecting the physical motion of getting up. And when you surf like a kook, now you're, now you're being impacted emotionally. Yes. And you've got that whole, the whole, yeah. you know, the self image of who you are. Yeah, your ego, right? Yeah, well, yeah, ego, it's this, you know, the, the self-image, so suddenly you don't want to go anymore. If you don't go, then yeah. you, you lose more quickness, you put on more weight, you do all of these things, and, it, and it's this ab absolutely self-destructive cycle down to where you die. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's, it's got to be, be something that's all of us that have taken such joy out of surfing and that it becomes... Uh, you know it literally is who we are yes it's the it's the 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 only thing that you can absolutely guarantee is the hub of your wheel is your passion for going surfing and what happens to you when you begin to lose that um and it's not reliable anymore and then i'm starting to walk down the stairs like i have a two-story house here in laguna i'm walking down the stairs and i'm thinking I need to hold the handrail because I don't feel fit enough and strong enough to walk down the stairs. And I'm just going, it's, it's actually really, really shocking this sort of sense of, um, you know, the, the inevitable decline yeah. That, yeah. 
that it's going to happen to all of us. And then a year and a half ago, I had a heart attack and was a widow maker and I, I could have died. Wow. But, you know, I um, went and I went to the right hospital, got the right ambulance, had the right surgeon and got a stent in there. And within two weeks, the cardiologist goes, you know, I said, what do I, what do I need to do, um, you know, for rehab? And I'm thinking 12, 12 weeks in a gym. And he says, go surfing. <laughs> And I went, oh, okay. So I went surfing. And, but all of this was possible. So this is time where I, I'm, I'm getting older, I'm getting slower, I'm getting heavier. My everything sort of breaks down in terms of agility and quickness. And uh, then I have the injuries and it's just worse and worse. And then just coincidentally, I'm, I'm uh, coach of the US team and we get involved in stand up paddling. And I begin, I, meet this new community of people and I start stand up paddling and I just went, whoa, everything that was holding me back from regular shortboard surfing is eliminated now. Yeah. I'm, I now am standing up and all of a sudden I can surf good again. And I know today that I can go out and I can get better at my craft of surfing on a different piece of equipment. Yeah. That, that whole po the, the shift in positive attitude yeah. is kind of miraculous for, you know, I'm 69 this year yeah. and, you know, that I stand up paddle surf like pretty good. Yeah, you're excellent. You're excellent. You're great. And it's, and it's really fun. Well, look, you're a great surfer. I mean, let's just cut to the chase, right? You're an excellent world champion level surfer. So that's carried over for you. Well, it, it has, and the, the, the fundamental things of being in a lineup, being able to select the right wave, position correctly, take off, do turns, and ride a wave to completion is like success in surfing. Yeah. And, and so I know that I'm going to be able to do this till the day that, you know, the widow maker takes me away yeah. at some point out in the surf somewhere. And I'll go happy because these years, um, after learning to do this uh, has made me really optimistic and happy and you know sort of go oh wow could I go to western Australia and ride a couple of waves at North Point like I believe I can't not on a really big day but like yeah. I believe I can today yeah and you know I'm I, you know can I get my ass kicked and get smashed yeah probably still I'm fit enough to do that so yeah. now I don't need to hold the rail walking down my stairs yeah, I can run down the stairs. Um, you know, I can go surfing, uh, and you know, the bottom line is when you get on a smaller stand-up paddleboard to surf good, it's a freaking workout. Oh yeah, oh Big yeah, time. oh yeah. So the the level of exercise that I get just going, I can go down to you know Thalia Street and Laguna Beach and go and get five waves and just you know power out, and I'm huffing and puffing. I'm getting an aerobic workout, I'm getting physical workout, and I'm riding a few waves, and I come in, I'm just going, wow, that was kind of fun. Oh, for sure, yeah. And that, that you know, what more can we ask for in our surfing um, that it still delivers? Yeah. That yeah. kind of stoke. Absolutely, that's cool. I'm stoked, you're inspiring me a little bit here. I, you yeah. know, you can see my stand-up paddleboard in the back, the thing hasn't been down for 15 years. <laughs> I might have to start doing this again. <laughs> well, the and in essence, it's it's sort of modified my thinking too. Um, the the whole experience with um, getting into the the coaching and stuff in in stand up paddle world and discovering a whole num whole bunch of people who are actually really nice, yeah, and super friendly and very yeah. welcoming, and yeah. they love the idea that there's a surfer. And and so my thing is like anyway, anytime we're near a wave. Like I've got a, you know, an encyclopedia of knowledge about yeah. waves. Yeah. And so people, they just loved it. And so, you know, I've traveled, you know, back in the old days, pre-pandemic. <laughs> yeah, you know, I was in New York. I was in Barbados coaching, like, you know, men and women, um, people who won world titles. Yeah. And yeah. just, it's really, for me, the whole coaching thing, you know, I consider myself more of a teacher. Mm -hmm. I teach skills, uh, I mentor in terms of attitude, determination to succeed, 
all of these things that, that become life skills for someone. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the, the, the actual coaching in a, in a heat is, um, you know, it's one part of it, but more importantly, it's teaching the skills of navigating a lineup. You know, which are the best waves out there? Which are the ones that, you know, if you were in a, if you just went out for a free surf and someone that's a really excellent person in a lineup will always get all the best waves. And so teaching those skills and having all the best waves, if you, if you condense it down to a heat, is the formula for winning. Yeah. Right? It's not, yeah. this is not rocket science. Well, and let me so ask you that, this. I, I got a question for you in regards to this because you and I both know that if you look at the top uh, 32 surfers in the world that are on the WSL championship tour, uh -huh. they're all incredible surfers. As far as their technique and their skill level, they're all incredible or they wouldn't be where they're at. And what really separates the champion and I say that singular uh, from the rest of them is between their ears, in my opinion. And, and is that something that you think um, is a crucial aspect? You know, I look at guys like Taj Burrow, great surfer, one of the greatest surfers in the world. Jordy Smith. These guys have not won world titles. Now, is that because Kelly Slater was in the way or is that because something they didn't have the drive? Uh, here's, I when, when I coach, I kind of, I, look, I put it into three areas. Strategy, which is how you use a lineup. Like, and this is a learned skill. The, it's, a learn, it's not luck, the person that gets the good waves all the time. It's a skill. Where is the good wave? How often does it come? Where do you need to be positioned to get that wave? So that's strategy in the lineup. And it's completely predict, um, applicable to just regular free surfing and just as it is vitally important for um, a competitive surfer. You have to be on the best waves to win. And then it's skills. How good a surfer are you? So clearly you can see that Taj Burrow and Jordy Smith in skills are like mind boggling, brilliant, mind boggling. So then the question comes down to why don't they win a world title? And so the third aspect to me is attitude. Like how willing are you to commit to winning? And if you watch Bustin down the door, the most mellow person in the world, Mark Richards, said in that movie, it was completely mind blowing to me that he would have died to win. And I'm just going, dude, the only other person I've ever thought would think like that is me. <laughs> because I literally would die to win. Yeah. And I came close. You did. Really close. You actually but, won and almost died in the yeah, 75, yeah, the 75 yeah. Duke, right? 75 Duke at Waimea. I mean, almost died. If, if I had have had a leash, I would have died because I would have been stuck in that spot, not washed in. I would have been stuck and had the third wave on the head and I would have been done. Yeah. But the second wave washed me in far enough to the third wave is all mellow. And, but, you know, it, it flicked the switch in my head as I just went, oh, shit, you know, you can die doing this crap. Yeah. Up to that moment, I didn't, didn't know. But the willingness to actually take that level of risk and commit yourself and do those things. So the, the bottom line is, if you're, tell, if you're saying to me that I just want to have fun, yeah. you're fucked. Yeah. You're done, right? Because there is someone that's not, it's not having, there's someone that realizes the most fun you have is winning. And so you do what's necessary. So I saw, I was watching the um, snapper contest a few years ago, and it comes down to Kelly and Taj have qualified for the, the grand final. Yeah. And it's kind of high tide-ish and pretty good wind. And Taj is like unbeatable. And so Kelly comes in and goes, well, you know, the waves are kind of mushy and whatever. And um, the tide's going to drop, so it'll get better. And Taj goes, oh, okay, well, well I'll wait. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, are you insane? Yeah. You just let your competitor change the field of play, first and foremost. And then they get ready for the fight. Well, of course, the tide dropped, and then the wind came up, and now it looks like Cocoa Beach. <laughs> And I'm just going, oh my God, you've just given the contest 
to Kelly. And then the last thing was Kelly, before the final, Kelly comes up to shake Taj's hand. Oh. And I'm just going, dude, you never touch someone. Like if it had been him coming up to me, I would have slapped his hand away and pushed him away and said, fuck off. Plus, we've seen that story before. We've seen this before with Kelly. We know how this ends. Although oh, my God. And so Kelly just goes out and blows up. Taj looks like awful. And Kelly wins. So all of those pieces are in the attitude aspect. Yeah. Well, right. if that's the case, and you look at the 32, can you look at the 32? Like, for, Well, let me put it to you this way. I look at some guys in the top 32, and I say to myself, that kid was 21 years old and they wrote him a check for four million dollars a year and he's set why does he even need a world title is some of this because they were given too much too soon well there's the you've got to be aggro and have motivation are you telling me that gabriel medina was a rich guy before he you know are you telling me that italo was rich there is no freaking way how could um adriano de souza yeah. win a world title yeah, he's the greatest example, I think, of willingness. Well, but there's historically there have been people sort of similar mindset. Yes. that go if if I don't succeed here, I'm going to be lying bricks. Which is kind of you and PT and that whole crew, right? That was those. We, my, yeah. I grew up. I mean, I didn't realize, but you know, because I grew up five houses from the beach. Yeah. But yeah, you know, we were renting a house yeah. from a wealthy farmer, right? Yeah. Uh, we didn't own that house. My my parents, my, it was only in older times that my parents could afford a house. Yeah. And so I grew up kind of poor. So I yeah. had to succeed. And so therefore, you got that motivation. So this attitude of, you know, um, just having, like I had a lot of fun, but yeah. I damn sure had to win to pay the bank off or to afford to be able to move on to the next event and stuff like that. And so there's a big payday here. Um, and, and so our payday in our time was, was winning events and taking prize money. Today, when the prize money is trivial compared to your sponsorship dollars, yeah. you, who, who, you, so you have your first allegiance to your sponsors, not to your success. Exactly. And so it's, it's easy to you know, pay off your house in San Clemente and, <laughs> um, do all of these things and have the big sponsors and all that sort of stuff uh, and not really worry about not having that check mark. Do you ever foresee a, a surfer from Southern California winning a world title because they, they, they just don't have the internal drive based on necessity? Well, I mean, I, I coached a lot of these people um, and, and to me, like I, I know I fundamentally got forced out of the US team coaching because I was too negative. Um, and the bottom line is that I'm not, a, I'm, I'm an incredibly optimistic person. And if I'm talking to you as a surfer, it's because I recognize some, some really incredible talent here. So now I've already run through my little checklist on my head on, you know, how's your strategy in the lineup? I do you always get the best waves. If not, I can teach you how to get them. Your skills, oh, wow, you know, you're pretty high up there in skills, but your attitude kind of sucks. If you're not willing to be really, really critical of yourself, then you don't have what it takes to be a champion athlete. Yeah. Like you've got to be ultra critical. So when I would try and, and, and communicate to people along this way, they just go, oh, fucking Kanga, the old guy, what the fuck does he know? Um, you know, all he does is just criticize me. Like I'm not going to kiss your ass and fucking blow smoke up your butt because you're fucking, you know, uh, in surfer pole. Like, dude, I was in surfer pole. Do you want, I've got six world tour victories. Like if you ever come close to my competitive results, then how about we have a different conversation? But for now, shut the fuck up and listen. Because I'm doing, I'm the guy that will give you the tools to succeed at a level beyond your amount well, I'll give you the tools to succeed at the level of your original imagination before losing over and over again, beat your uh, psyche down to the point where you're willing to accept it. Let me ask you again, because I'm of the opinion that North American surfers are way too soft to ever win a world title. And I'm not saying they're not some of the greatest free surfers in the world, 
Will a North American surfer, in your opinion, and I know we're generalizing, we're throwing a big blanket on the, a bunch of people here, but will a North American surfer ever win a world title in, say, um, the next five years, the next five years? Well, the person that I think is really, well, look at That doesn't winner. include John John, obviously. But I mean, John John, yeah. I consider him Hawaiian, not, I'm talking about mainland USA. Well, men, I don't know. And you got to look, look at the structure of the tour. Women, I think Carolyn Marks has the ability to win a world title. Yeah. Um, Lanky Peterson has the ability. Well, I'm not talking about ability. I, I, they're all able. I'm talking about between the ears, the, the uh, well, willingness. What I'm, what I'm saying is that Lakey and Courtney um, have in my three areas, um, some really big strength. I mean, there is no person that's more of an animal in competitive surfing than Courtney Conlogue. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, so where are her weaknesses? What does she need to work on? And, and so like when, if you analyze that and you find that losing, you know, coming second or third in the world title as Courtney and Lakey have done, um, it comes down to something, something really fundamental and simple. It's, it's like, where, where's the creativity? Because what you've got to understand that you get, um, you start off in, a, in surfing, it's all exciting and creative and fresh and inventive, but competition squeezes you into a box. It's, the box is this 20 or 30 minute time period. And the 20 or 30 minute time period is completely diametrically opposed to regular surfing. So regular surfing is timeless. You get a great wave, you've had an awesome session, but you have to have that great wave within that 20 or 30 minute time period. So if you're not able to actually change your thinking and how to compress it into this box, but when, when you compress something into a box like that, you've eliminated the most special part, which is the creativity. So how do you learn the timing of being able to generate those scoring waves in that time. And then at that point, then you've got to bust out the creativity. You see what I'm saying? And there are people that are locked into the, you know, I would say that Courtney and, and Lakey and even Carolyn Marks, for instance, um, are still locked in the box and they haven't busted out the creativity. Yeah, but and, that's a good problem, right? Because we know that, that can ha that's probably going to happen. That comes almost with maturity in some, on some level because we know they already had it. And so what I think you're saying is that those two or three people have the willingness, the, 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 the situation between the ears is there. You sense it. And so yes. now the good news is, because you can't really teach that, in my opinion. You can teach the other two. Right. Well, no, the, the, the willing to grind. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, not many, not many people want to roll up the sleeves and go to work. Exactly. And, and, and that's, that's, that's kind of my he, point. That's my point. Like I don't, North American men, I don't see, I don't see it happening. No. And, um, except for I, maybe I, I, Kanoa, Kanoa Igarashi has, because of his cultural, his cultural situation is a bit different and he's got some of that Japanese, um, I don't even know how to paraphrase it, but you, I think you know what I mean. I think that there's some internal drive there that's bigger well, than- Well, there's some work ethic. Thank you, yes. The, the work ethic and the determination to improve himself. Yes. But there's something, um, in the end, there's gotta be something exceptional. You, you know what I'm saying? Which yep. is, which is, you know, you don't see it often, but actually I had uh, ran when, um, Connor Coffin and Kanoa when they were all kids and we're doing some US team workouts and stuff. And Kanoa always got the best wave, right? There's an exceptional instinctive skill set that Kanoa has. And you watch him in all these heats, he's always on an incredible wave. This is, this is sort of like a natural exceptional skill that he has. So when you combine that with his willingness to grind and improve his, his skills, and then you combine that with his desire to succeed at the ultimate level, so when Kanoa sort of pitches out the idea that he wants to be world champion, you know that he's got the grind and the will. You know that he will take the criticism and improve his skill set. And he instinctively has the exceptional talent of always choosing the best way. So I'm, I would put him in the Adriana D'Souza category. Yeah. That 
uh, will uh, um, yeah, because I was I was commentating at Margaret River on a big day. John John, I mean, we know John John, Margaret River, please reinvented the place. But it was kind of medium waves and big sets. And there were 10 point waves as big sets. But Adriano used priority to draw John John. Adriano got in front in the heat, you drew John John in to defend priority and got caught in side by sets. So it was just sort of like genius yeah. strategically. Yeah. And it was sort of what Adriano needed to do was to prevent John John from getting those 10 foot waves. How could he do it? By using the priority rule in such a way. And I'm just watching it happen and just going, oh my God. It may have been the year that Adriano won. I was just going, this guy is smart. Yeah, yeah. He's and I just had a comment with him about Bell's Beach. Like, have you seen Adriano's results at Bell's Beach? They're incredible. They're, pre they're, they're up there with Paco. Yeah. But there's something really interesting there. Everyone talks about the Bell's Bowl. And yeah, there's a wave there, but there's actually in a, in a set, there's a wave that will actually peel from Rincon yeah. all the way across to the Bell's Bowl. Yes. And the takeoff is like 50 yards deeper than yes. everyone else. Paco, why is Paco like 50 yards deeper and he gets two or three more turns? The only other surf that I've seen is do that is Adriano. And I, I learned that place in the lineup from a friend of mine who was a Bell's Beach surfer. He taught me that way. And so you look down the line and you don't see it really standing up at the bowl. You know, this one's going to peel all yeah. the way through. So you get two or three more turns, two or three more turns before it goes flat after the bowl is when you heat. Who was that surfer that gave you that insight? Oh my God. I can't remember. He's died now. Yeah. It was, just right. a, it was no in worries. the early seventies, Yeah. you know, because Victorians are outsiders and West Australians are outsiders. Yeah, we became friends. You know? <laughs> oh. Don't worry about it. I'm not going to. It'll come to you tomorrow. You can call yeah. me later. Yeah, but it's I I I look at these things and study this. I mean, have you ever watched Paco at, at J Bay? Sure, of course. He's a hundred yards deeper. Yeah. Uh, how could you? Uh, you cannot beat someone that takes off a hundred yards deeper and makes the wave, because the judges are just you know they're just going comparing this ride to that and they go okay you know you know um kelly you've got a really really good wave i mean normally that would be like a nine five but paco took off 100 yards deeper and did three more turns like he's got to get a higher score and so the, from a far distance the the judges are, are actually calculating that into the final score was Michael Peterson like that at Bells? Do you think, or was Michael Peterson just turns for turns for more turns, so more scoring? Did he know that spot like you knew that um, spot? Yes, somewhat. And the guy that really, the two people that really made this happen that I saw was Midget Farrelly. Yeah, way way deep. And then Ted Spencer. Mm -hmm. Ted Spencer took off really deep. He was a goofy foot, wasn't he, Ted? Ted no, no. Ted oh. Spencer was a regular foot. And you should look up uh, John, Whit John Witzig's uh, thing on Instagram. He talks about Ted, and I commented on Ted. I'll Ted check it was out. a really good surfer. It was Nat, in our mind as kids. Yeah. Nat Wayne and Ted. Yeah. Right. What about, what about Midget? Well, Midget got eliminated by the whole new era. Yeah, thing. there was like a, there was almost like an Australian hooey that you talked about in your oh, book. Wow, well, they they kind yeah. of pushed Midget out of the situation, didn't they? But I I grew up because uh, Midget came to Western Australia and surfed at Yelling Up as a demo, and I met him, and so I became friendly with Midget, and then I rode his boards, and then Midget I worked at his factory, and he taught me how to shape and all of these things. So I had a really good relationship with Midget. Midget was like an unusual guy. Yeah. How but, so? How so? Oh, just really uh, opinionated and and um, not that sounds that, like you. <laughs> well, yeah, maybe. But 
he was just an extraordinary surfer because he took up sailboarding and did all of these other things. Yeah. And um, like midget tied for first, like of course he won in 66, but in 1970 he tied for first against Rolf Arness. Yeah. And before that, 1968, he tied for first with Fred Hemmings in um, Puerto Rico. Right. So, but for a, you know, a pubic hair, Midget would have been a three times world champion. Yeah. Imagine, uh, and, yeah. and remember that Puerto Rico and also 1970 was the era when Nat Wayne and Ted were, you know, preeminent. Right. 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 So Midget was right up there. But that whole thing really impacted Midget negatively. It was almost um, like, wasn't it true that it was like a Witzig and the media kind of shunned the whole Midget Fairly side of the equation? Oh, yeah. The, you know, surfing world, you can look up the issue. Um, there's a picture of black and white picture of Midget on the beach at Makaha with his Makaha trophy. And it says the new era. And you turn the page and like you've literally turned the page <laughs> on Midget. Oh my God. And, and here's the new era. <laughs> and I don't know, I, I mean, the, the Witzigs had a powerful machine. And did, the, uh, the did, did Midget did, piss them off? Did Midget just piss those guys off? Well, or I'm sure he pissed everyone off, you know? Yeah, right. Uh, you know, simply because of, he just wouldn't go with the flow. Right. And he was straight and, you know, just the yeah, whole yeah. hippie. Or, you know, simply because like, for as astonishingly bohemian the surf world appeared to be, it's really, really not that inclusive right. for people with alternative thinking. Right. Like you either become one of the tribe and you act like the tribe. Yes. You, know, Loba, you, you, you sure as hell can't be the lone guy yes. up the beach. I've often said surfers are the most conservative group of people I know. Yeah. And it's, uh, and it's not a, I, I mean, I, I, I've lived my entire life as a, a member of the tribe, but I'm that guy up the beach by myself. Yeah. And, and I'm completely comfortable uh, just being me. Yeah. Um, you know, which, and it's, you know, I, I often blurt shit out that I just think to myself, oh my God, you know, what are you thinking? Yeah. And, <laughs> but, you know, it's because I, I actually just say what I think. Yeah. And I'm, you know, so I'm so used to it now. I, I just know that the arrows are coming. Yeah. So like, <laughs> I just turn and let the thick skin <laughs> on the back just absorb the arrows and they drop away yeah. and I just go well fuck it miss me <laughs> hey let me let me bring you back a little bit to midget and and you shaping surfboards he he mentored you he, you learned how to shape from midget fairly um how many boards did you make before you made the transition say in in 73 to hawaii and you, and you basically got on bk's boards and some other guys boards how many boards like you shaped a bonzer for yourself like how many boards were in your stable of boards and how did you have a label was there a kanga label was there some ian cairns surfboards label out there well i i i shaped about a thousand boards i i worked you know i firstly i worked in midgets factory you know fixing dings and and midgets factory like it was either perfect or it went back and got fixed. Yeah. And whoever made it not perfect paid for it to be fixed. Yeah. So, I mean, right from the thing, like the shapes, but let me tell you, there was no little scratch mark on a, on a foam blank after a shape job. Yeah. I mean, it was flawless, right? Then it went to the glasser, right? And that glasser was unbelievably perfect. Oh, there were no bubbles in a glass job and a midget board. Yeah. And um, then the, you know, the, so the colors, the sanding, the pinstripes, the fins, like they laid out the fins, you know, the, the layers of fins. The fins were all of those multi hued, you know, layer, you know, red and black yeah. and yellow resin in between. Just, and then the sand job on the fin was just perfect, you know, with all of those different layers showing. Just like it, it was the, um, the ultimate place for the extremely perfect um, board maker's you know, art yes. was, was in his place. And it yeah. was remorseless, like midget was merciless. There were, you know, it didn't come to the, to the showroom 
until the gloss coat was perfect, the pin, everything was perfect. So it was actually really interesting to go and learn to shape there, you know, because, um, you know, you, it, it had to be perfect in terms of this. But then the design thing, he was part of everything. Like when there was a shortboard revolution, like he had a V bottom shortboard. Oh, yeah. He, if you watch um, Hot Generation, and when they're talking about animal and that at bells, you watch midget surfing, like it's pretty darn good. Yeah. And he's on a stringerless shortboard, yeah. right? So he was right there for design. So he made me, you know, quite a few boards. And, um, you know, I have some old pictures of a, a pintail. He made side slippers. Remember that? Yeah, I'm, when, I'm yeah, much younger than you are, my friend. Reno. You need to look this up. Reno. I know, I know what you're talking about, but I don't remember it as if I was there. Oh, my God. Reno and, and Jerry Lopez come to the Huntington Beach Championships on the side slipper. And the side slipper had this really wide center, narrow, little blunt nose, huge kick on the nose, tiny fins. And so they would come and they would kick the tail out and the board would just slide down the wave sideways and then they would go reconnect the rail reconnect, and off they would go and boom so i got a side slipper i can remember surfing guillotine of the right hander you know slide side slipping down the face of the wave then reconnecting and turning and stuff these are the sorts of innovations like midget was on top of all of this stuff yeah um uh, really open-minded to like advancement yeah and you know so i you know, I, I really, really, and I mean, this one, I like cars, right? Yeah. So Midget had a GT Falcon. Right. He had multiple. Like Holden is like Chevy. Yep. And Ford is the Falcon, right? Yep. And so it, it, it evolved, like they both had these massive hoon cars, we call them, like V8s and as fast as, you know, four on the floor, but the whole routine. Yeah. And, uh, a GT Falcon, I remember I, I get a ride back because he lived at Palm Beach and my aunt lived at Avalon, you know, kind of where I started. So I was yeah. staying, he, he would drop me off at my aunt's place after working at the factory. And um, so there's one time you know, we're flogging through New, Newport and there's this car parked away from the sidewalk and he just fucking drops it down a gear and guns it between the sidewalk and this parked car in the in the GT Falcon and Kanga's in there just going, yes, I love this shit. <laughs> like those those sorts of memories. Like that's that's my midget. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. Cool. Right. Very good. He's this this guy who's just really tormented and very difficult and a perfectionist, but he will still just fucking go for it in his GT Falcon. Yeah. And it was like, God. Oh. And, and so those are the things. So I have this sort of because I didn't actually drink all the Kool-Aid. Right. With the and 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 to me, I still think the most influential surfer in Australian surfing is Nat. Yeah. You know, he's the basis of Paco, my style and Paco. It's the carved power flow. Yeah. Um, school of surfing that came from Nat. Yeah. Um, midget was more hot dog, a little bit more Californian in terms of style, you know, uh -huh. a bit more flair, hot dog. But the mm -hmm. fundable, fundamental meat and potatoes of Australian traditional surfing came from that. Yeah. And. But, you know, I kind of have a, a love hate relationship with that. Yeah. You know, because. Well, you guys are kind of similar in many ways, in my well, opinion, from what I can see, you know. Um, like I, I think I have a pretty giant ego, but but I'm willing to actually look in the mirror and go to Kanga, like, come on, dude, settle <laughs> down. But Nat doesn't. Like it's Nat's Nat and that's that. Well said. To this day, right? it's just like, and I've been in heats uh, and seen him like have meltdowns. Yeah. I mean, and I've just gone. Whew, I'm glad it's not directed at me because yeah. I wouldn't respond well. Yeah. And I had a heat, I actually had a heat with Nat in a longboard contest at Hossegor, where, you know, Nat's like an extraordinary surfer. He was a champion paddler. I mean, everything he did was just fucking brilliant yeah. and unbelievable. So we're in a, you know, we get in a paddle battle in this heat 
This is this like one of these um, 1990s longboard contests? Yeah, it was oh, in the early 90s. We went there. I was doing some work for a you know, Oxbow uh, or something. Oh no, I was doing. He was with Oxbow. I was doing some work with Dynacom on the ASP events. Right. And so I was there for that. And I was in the longboard contest, with, which was concurrent with the Hasselgore event. Yeah. And so Nat's going, yeah, and he can't paddle past me because I'm not fucking letting Pat, uh, you know, Nat out paddle me. Yeah. And he goes, fuck you, Kangi, you kook. And he tries to hit me and all this sort of shit. <laughs> and I'm thinking, well, fuck now, it's on. Like, I'm not putting up with this kind of bullshit from this fucking guy. Right, you know, because I got some points on the board too. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. And so, yeah. yeah, we come in. I lose the heat because I'm all spun out. And I yeah. see him in the showers. And I'm right, fucking beeline right at you, you fucking shithead. <laughs> and he sees me coming <laughs> and he does a runner. <laughs> and I'm just going, I'm on steam out the ears. Like it would have just been fucking full, you know, gone to blows right there under the shower at the contest. And oh my God. So he so disappears. <laughs> And you know, I'm, I'm, I'm there. I do my work, and I come and and I go up to Paris to leave. And I'm at the. Ch I'm changing my French money for dollars, right? So I, I I change it, and then the next guy comes, steps up, and they go, "I'm sorry, sir, we're out of dollars." And I looked around. It was Nat. <laughs> I got the last dollars, <laughs> <laughs> and so we're all, you know. You know, when you see the dogs in the parking lot sniffing around and you know, the, when, we're not going to go, we're not going to go to blows now. Yeah, yeah. So anyhow, we go and the bus goes around and around, you know, De Gaulle, right? Yeah. So they climb in, I've taken the last dollars and who should get on the bus at the next stop, but Nat. And uh -oh. it was just like, I just daggers, right? And it was th this sort of, um, you know, the, the confrontation of egos yes. at this level is it's almost you know, childish. It's, it's such fucking baby shit. But it's <laughs> awesome. It's super fun. You get great stories. You know, 30 years later, you got fucking killer stories, man. How did, how did, the, how did this resolve? It just dissipated. And then I, I saw at Angari when Nat got beat up because he hustled some kid and the dad came down and just worked him over because nat is just a dick in the water yeah uh, every way is nat's way yeah and they weren't having it right so yeah. that kind of um was the first moment like you know um, i don't have never spoken to nat but um like what do you mean absolute, you've met what do you mean you've never spoken to nat uh, since all of that happened yeah but i you know i have heard that he's toned down a lot yeah. Because you know, when you live your life in absolutely absolute certainty that you are the man, yeah, and you discover you're not, yeah. Um, There's yeah. some humility. Well, finally, some humility. Some humility. Yeah, I don't. You know, but it's still that. I, I just see this sort of pantheon of people have gone through this world of of surfing yeah and um you know i just find it really interesting all of the massive personalities and the yeah. idiosyncrasies and the differences and yeah. um i mean michael peterson right he and i had some of the most gnarly uh competitive experiences and in terms of strategy in the lineup we're talking like a 20 out of 10 yeah particularly on a point break like yeah. he would paddle me up at the point of Burley and then he'd be gone because of the current. He'd be like 30 yards down the point before I knew it on the best wave of the day. Yeah. And I would just go, really? Did I just fall for that again? That was, so it wasn't until, I mean, 1976, uh, I won the Allen Oak contest there was a world tour event in yeah. 76 and I think 77. And yeah. I was in a, in a, in a heat and Michael begs me for a wave. Michael Peterson begs Kanga for a wave. What's that sound like exactly? It's, hey, Kanga, you know, you, can I, can I get one? And I had the inside, it's a reef break, dude. Like, yeah. come on, please. <laughs> uh, no fucking way. And I got the bomb 
and he got eliminated. And I just went, <laughs> there you go. I've suffered enough pain from you. But but what happens was, and I you know, I look at this, without having adversaries yeah. of amazing talent, yeah. we don't rise to areas that perhaps you know we would never imagine. So to me, it's it's just uh, really really cool. And here's here's something like the, the other day, um, I'm on LinkedIn and I get um, a friend request from this person, Denise Peterson. And I'm thinking, Denise Peterson, like my mother's maiden maiden name is Peterson, right? So I'm thinking, Denise, my I had an older sister who died and died whose name was Denise. Yeah. And I'm Denise Peterson's friend of me. Like, is this something out of, out of, you know, yeah. the the universe? Yeah. And so I, I finally I just go, hey, are we related? And she goes, no, we're not. But um, you might know my brother Tommy. Ah. And I'm going, no, come on, not Tommy Peterson. Like, yeah. it's Michael Peterson. And she goes, yeah, he's my brother. And I'm just going, you can't even imagine how out of body this moment is. That's so, cool. Yeah, and she said, oh, yeah, I know who you are. You know, I've watched you surfing, you surf. And so, and, I've, and she says, I'm making some T-shirts with Michael on it. And I want to send you one. So I'm waiting for the mail to come to get my Michael Peterson T-shirt from Denise's sister. And I'm going to put it on and take a photo. And I'm going to send this picture to her. Sweet. Because... They, you know, Kanga wouldn't be Kanga without Michael. Yeah. But I, I want to bring it back to Nat a little bit because I don't feel like, let me ask you this. If Nat rang your doorbell right now, what would go down? Like, I guess if he's coming to your house, that sent, that, that's a bit of a. Well, I mean, what? What? Here's what I. I resolve this for me. What, what's up what with I, you and Nat? Here's, and here's, you know, where I'm at personally. Um, I actually. Uh, see these rivalries as an incredibly value valuable aspect of my uh, development as a person. Yeah, you know, because without overcoming overwhelming odds, yeah, you never discover you know uh, you know the incredible things that you that you're capable of. Yeah. So we get pushed in all of these things. So I like and so if if I was um, you know, in Burley and I saw Nat, I'd be going, Nat, awesome, great to see you. Hey, let's have a coffee. Let's have a yeah. laugh. Remember that fucking time you hassled me? It was so fun. I, I know what you would do, but I'm wondering what do you think Nat would do? I see, I don't know. But it's, it's, these are the things that at our age, we've got to just be going, Yeah. look at the fabric of the quilt that we've built. Yes. And you're a part of it. And it's kind of like a pretty cool story. And we should be able to just have a beer and celebrate. Absolutely. And, and I think he would. I think he would. I think he would too. Yeah. I, I think he'd be going, yeah, you know what, Kanga? I know I was a dick. Yeah. And, and, but. No, no. I think after three schooners, you guys are back at it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, who knows? And so it's like, I, I would love to have these moments. Like obviously with Michael, we can't have that. Yeah. But there's so many other people, like I've had those moments with, with Buzzy where we just laugh about shit because we were very competitive. Yeah. And um, one time I took him over the falls in a headlock at, at um, Halieva <laughs> underwater. And, you know, because it's, I saw him throw his board across in front of Mark Richards to catch, catch Mark Richards's leash. Yeah. And I'm thinking, you're Buzzy Kerbox, and that's Mark Richards, right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> don't, don't be cheating with MR. Right. And so the next the semifinals come around. Wait, wait, was that, a, was that a nationalistic thing or was that a friend? No, no, thing? no, it's just simply a recognition of, dude, like Mark Richards is untouchable. Right. For all of us. Yeah, like you just go, okay, you, you've you've yeah. outpositioned me. Yeah, uh, you're you're the like one of the greatest ever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, lesson learned. All right. Right? all right, all right. 
Fair and enough. and so Buzzy, yeah, it was really, really like hands Buzzy and Michael Ho were gnarly in the water. Like, like I never got to wave my now by myself again once those yeah. guys came on tour. Yeah. Never. They hassled the they hassled each other, hassled everyone. Yeah. So Buzzy paddles to my inside on about a 10 foot wave at Haliiba and I just went off, oh, no way. So we both stand up and I just angled left on him <laughs> and I grabbed him in a headlock and took him over the falls in the headlock. And at the bottom of the wave, you know, Haliiba explodes, man. When we were exploding in a headlock, like it sends a message and boom, like you're fucking crazy. And I go, yes. <laughs> And you know what? I never even got an interference for that. I'm like, it was just blowing my mind. But the the point is that the today you tell those stories, it's just really funny. Yeah. And it's yeah. and without having people that you were you know highly competitive with. Yeah. Um, and you have all of these incidents like they. They, they enrich all of us. Yeah. And, and it's so I, I would hope that we'd have all of these experiences so we could just talk about that shit and just laugh about it. Yeah. It's, I let mean, me I ask you to... this. Let me, let me, if I can, I'd like to just shift gears a, a little bit because I was talking to you about midget and your shaping and, and I want to get to this bonzer that you made for Hawaii. I think it was yeah. red. PT had sent you some sort of letter that said, hey, I'm on these bonzers from the Campbell brothers. Make yourself one and, and come to Hawaii with it. Well, that seems rather revolutionary, this idea of putting three fins on a board. And in your mind, do the, first of all, do the Campbell brothers get enough credit for the three fin surfboard? Or is Simon's well, thruster different than this? Like, I mean, well, that's kind of ballsy to just go, okay, PT says I should build a bonds or I've never even heard of these things. I'm just going to do it. Like, that's crazy. Well, it, remember the letters. There was the form of communication. Yeah. And so I got a letter from PT. He'd got a letter from Mike Eaton. Uh, who was shaping bonds as a Bing. Right. With the Campbell brothers. So. The Campbell brothers got Mike Eaton to do a bonza and Mike Eaton sent this uh, letter to PT and PT wrote another letter and sent, because it wasn't a photocopy machine. He didn't photocopy yeah. Mike Eaton's letter yeah. and send me. So just think this has gone from the Campbell brothers to Eaton to PT gone across the Nullarbor to Kanga and Kanga's gone and created a Bonza, which <laughs> of course it was completely different. Like it, yeah, it had the two big, two big concaves and it had yeah. these little, it didn't have the full keel fins. It had these right. little bumpy things. And I had the big old monster single fin in it. Yeah. But that thing was fast. Yeah. And so it was seven foot six, the one that I won the Smirnoff on. Yeah. And so I rock up and I've got Bonzas Seven six was my big board, and I had a seven footer. And uh, of course, if you if the Campbell brothers had have compared my bonds with theirs, that'd be kind of pretty different. Yeah. But in those days, that that was the form the the Jungle Telegraph. That yeah. that's how information happened, and it happened. Just imagine that timeline of how long did it take for Mike Eden to yeah. write a letter and for it to get to Sydney or Queensland and for PT to absorb this and then send me a letter. Yeah. And then I guess there was this uh, trust in evolving design concepts. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like this is meant to be more powerful and fast and all of this sort of stuff. So there's massive experimentation. Um, this, this board that you built, um, I mean, you like you said, you won the 73 Smirnoff on this. This was sort of your go-to design, but as a three-fin surfboard, did you did you look at it like revolutionary, or did you just look at it like, yeah, this will stabilize my single fin? Well, my single fins were big, and I've never had a fin too big. Right. Right. So to me, it was just more fin. Right. And actually, when when Simon won the um, 
the bells contest on the thruster, I was riding a Nev Hyman three fin with a single fin with two side stabilizers. Really? Yes. Yeah. Nev Hyman and a channel bottom, <laughs> in fact. Right. Channel bottom. What are you stable. saying? Are you saying that you're the first guy with a thruster? Well, people keep on coming up to me and going, thank you for inventing the thruster. <laughs> and I go, well, here's the address. You know, you can Venmo me the dollar. <laughs> but, but no, Simon's boards were really different. And, and Simon made me a thruster. And I loved the feel of the board. You know, it was really soft yeah. and smooth and flowed. But I kept on blowing the fins out off yeah. the top and in those days you carved everything yeah so i i, I maybe i invented the blowtail yeah yeah i think you did and the thruster <laughs> <laughs> no, but but so this this board you know did i i, I got a two-page spread in sports illustrated with with the linear k a wall across both pages with this red board flying down the line that said chairman of the board Cool. And that was um, Surfer Shaper wins you know, the world title. Yeah. And, you know, so that was the culmination, you know, because I shaped a lot of boards. It's, you know, I, I didn't go to university, but I started shaping boards um, and making as much money per week as like someone who went to university shaping yeah. boards. Yeah. And I, I ultimately, I, I didn't shape in glass. I, I sold shaped blanks and people would take them off. Right. And, you know, it was Ian Cantz with surfing in mind. And that was, the, that uh, was your logo? Yeah. Cool. I had a, you know, a cutback or something, Ian yeah. Cantz with surfing in mind. And the, it was. It you, ever was see, a, it, you ever see any of these boards floating around? Yeah. People, people send me stuff all the time and there were models. Um, the, this I is mean, all in book, WA, right? This is all in Western Australia. This is all in Western Australia. Um, mm. You know, and I would sell shaped blanks and they'd take the blank and get it glass. You know how people do it today. Is this, is this like 1970 to 1973, something like that? Uh, 1970 was shaping, probably up to 76. Was oh, really? Oh, really? But you weren't riding your boards in Hawaii. You were, I would ride you went some, there? no. After I won the Smirnoff, in i i bought a couple of boards off bk yeah and yeah because bk was kind of like my alter ego at sunset yeah like absolutely you know created completely different lines on that wave to yeah. everyone else and you know so i copied those and did my own thing yeah. and um then i just thought wow and i wrote his boards and i just go whoa these things surf good. So that snapback photo yeah. is a seven foot BK. The, the one on the Surfer Magazine cover. You know? Yeah, on yeah. the Surfer cover. Yeah, uh, And that was January of 74, after I'd first started. And I, and I realized that it's highly unlikely for someone to be a high performance champion surfer, and then also a shaper. Right. You know, it's, I mean, Shane Haran tried to be a design. Well, guy. let's hold on for a minute because we know MR did that, right? But not really in Hawaii. MR was riding brewers or whatever. Yeah. And then Abelura. I'm thinking Reno. Yeah, Reno did it. And um, Terry Fitzgerald, although I, maybe competitively he wasn't on the same level as you guys. But, but there were some back then, if it was ever going to happen, it was back. It was going to happen then. No, it, was, it, it, it did. And, and you would argue that Simon. Yep. Um, sacrificed his surfing for the, thr the thruster. Right. The experimentation of it all. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, was, I was in an Australian titles at Narrabeen when Simon was in the juniors and in the open, and he won the juniors in the open. And yeah. uh, I mean, we're talking like really good, absolutely brilliant. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, mm. the Joel Parkinson of his time. Yeah. But the thing, and I don't know whether it was the shaping or whether it was the attitude aspect. Yeah, you know, we've talked about. Yeah, probably not as determined to win. Yeah, which forces you to grovel in those days. You don't want to. Yeah, yeah, which gives you that little bit extra, and and then you become like Mr. Mr. was just brilliant in little waves. You know, you grew up at Merriweather in Newcastle, of course. 
<laughs> but then for him to be that good at yeah. wire mayor and stuff, that was like surprising to me. Yeah. He beat me in the Smirnoff. Yep. And I just went, hmm. Yeah, that's inspiring. Beat me once. Not again. <laughs> Let me ask you this, back to your boards in Hawaii. So you're writing BKs. Then the, um, the situation that we all know unfolded, unfolded the drama on the North Shore um, with, the, with the Hui and um, those guys, you know, the busting down the door era occurred. And at one point you went to Hawaii and I think it was 76 and there were no boards available for you. you uh, my used... boards, there were, yeah. there were, the boards from 75 had disappeared. Those were BKs, right? The BK, the white BK that I won the 75 Duke on. Yeah. If there was ever a board I would want, that would be it. Yeah. That's the only one that I, I really care about. Yeah. The white eight foot six BK. I had yellow BKs that if you watch the, um, the 75 Smirnoff, Rabbit's borrowing one of my boards and I'm on a BK. Right. So Rabbit borrowed some of my boards. I was getting these boards, they're all lightning bolts. The whole deal was you just give them back to Jack. He has them waiting. You come back next year. And I came back and I, oh, we don't, we, we don't have your boards anymore. Yeah. Um, and then sorry. you knew, and you knew why. Oh, yeah. Of course. Someone had spoken to Jack, never has admitted this, but someone spoke to him and said, you know, these guys aren't welcome here. Yeah. If you want to stay in business, yeah. this is what you need to do. And, and, and so do you, that was obviously the the clan of the the Hui guys that were that were well, laying down those. Yeah, I mean, we we all think that's what it is, and it probably was. I don't know for sure. Yeah. You know, because I didn't. I don't want to, you know. I don't. We don't need to go here if you don't want to. I don't care. I don't want to re redress that. So I don't either. I'm on the North Shore. I want to talk about your boards there, though, because this wants to get. I want to get to your parishes, basically. Yeah. Well, my parishes. I've got no boards. Everyone knows why I got no boards. Yeah. And suddenly, you know, Tom Parrish says, um, oh, there's this set of boards up at um, Jack Reeves's glass shop that um, a customer uh, didn't want to pick up. Yeah. And they're yours if you want them. Yeah. And that's the board you got. Yeah, and those didn't have bolts on them, right? They were just oh no, they were just they were just yellow surfboards. Yeah, um, narrow pin tails. I think I had like a seven o seven six and an eight foot or an eight six or something. What is that board that you've got? Yeah, it's eight six and it's got a baby swallow and it says for Ian on it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Tom Parrish defied the strictures of laid down on that winner. And he made boards that weren't for me, but were for me. Right. And I went on and, uh, you know, came second in the world. I won the World Cup yeah. um, on those boards. And, you know, it's thank you very much, Tom Parrish, yeah. for, for being uh, like a man independent of the, all, all of that pressure. Yeah. And it's, to me, that's, you know, you get the, Get huge respect for that sort of stuff yeah. and um you know so i you know i won the i mean the the world cup at halley evil it's kind of big were you riding the eight six the one no, that i, I showed you the eight oh the eight footer the eight six was the the, the eight six was my go-to board for wire mayor yeah and the the white bk is the one i won the duke on and i came second in the smirnoff the year before in 75 yeah um and if you if you look like when I won the Duke it was about the same size as the last Eddie. Yeah. Closeouts, the whole thing. Yeah. And I was on an eight six. Yeah. Taking off under the lip. Yeah. Late takeoffs. So, and literally guys <laughs> at the bottom of the wave, like Hackman. I have a photograph of me turning behind Hackman. Yeah. And he was, as I'm taking off, he's at the bottom. And, you know, my idea was you drop down and you do a turn and you try and go off the top. <laughs> <laughs> and so I went behind Hackman, went off the top and stuff. And it was, I mean, Hackman always had big boards for his size. Yeah. 
So even if he was probably riding a nine footer and he's much smaller than me. Yeah. So proportionally his boards were always big. Yeah. And that's why you see so many uh, photos and videos of Hackman at sunset doing a fade. Yeah. Cause he's caught the wave on the shoulder side of the peak and he's fading back into the peak. Whereas my stupid head was always like, I need to take off behind the peak yeah. and drop down. Yeah. Uh, and this is the like the evolution of surfing in big waves. Like I took off deep yep. at, at Waimea. Wait. Well, the, so these parishes. How long did you ride these boards? I mean, these yellow parishes that you had. Did you did you ride them for three or four seasons, or was it just no, the seventy six? No, that was the one season for seventy six. Yeah. And I don't know if I gave them back to Tom. You know, thank you very much. But in seventy seven, I had different boards. But you know, I was kind of. Um, 77 it was the year of Big Wednesday. Yeah. And it was where we, you know, we traveled and we got treated like kings and earned. You, did you soften up in 77? Is that what happened? Well, completely. Because <laughs> I got spoiled. I just think, yeah. man, I should, I should stay in Hollywood, become a, um, a well known actor. And, <laughs> you know. Yeah, good on you. It was, it was funny. I, I posted a, um, here it is here. It's a Warner Brothers. Oh, cool. It's a Screen Actors Guild check from Warner Brothers for $46.17. This year? You get that this year? Yeah, I just got it at 11.18. 11.18. I just got it like you know, a couple of weeks ago. That's and classic. The address is um, 5 West Kui Lima Loop, Kui Lima Estates, Kahuku, Hawaii. Because PT and I bought a condo at the Kui Lima together. Oh, oh okay. And Mark Warren, we, the Bronze Dozies bought this condo at the Kui Lima on the golf course. Yeah. And um, you know, ultimately we sold it, of course. So I wish we had kept it. Imagine that. I know. Uh, wow. But, you know, so we had enough to buy a, a, buy a condo on a golf course in Hawaii. We had enough money. You know, we made, in 1976, I won 8,000 bucks in 1977, I earned 50 grand from Big Wednesday. Yeah. I, that's a pretty significant. And so if that was the moment when I was beginning to question the concept of pro surfing. Yeah. And, I, you know, so we, we were doing the bronze dozies and I put more focus into that. And yeah. I did come back uh, 78 and 1980. I qualified for the Hawaiian events through the pro class trials. Right. Right. I was off the tour, yeah. not enough rankings to get in the events. Went in the pro class trials. I won them in 78 and ultimately came, I you know, came second in the world cup to Buzzy, Buzzy Kerbox <laughs> at Sunset Beach. Oh my Lordy. Well, let me ask but, you this. You're in the pro class trials in 78. You got to be looking at these kids, you know, relatively speaking, you're going, who are these punks? I got to surf against these guys. Was it tough for you to kind of get over that hurdle? No, it was just, oh, what? Pro class trials at Sunset Beach, are you kidding? Easy could, peasy. Couldn't be, couldn't be easier. Yeah, yeah. And, and so in 19, and I, I'm, I'm making a point here because I got into World Tour events through a trials. Yeah. And I came second in 78 in the World Cup. And in 1980, I, I didn't win the pro class trials, but I, I qualified for the events in Hawaii and I won the World Cup. Yeah. So there's actually a very big lesson there in terms of someone young and outside the system having an opportunity to integrate with the system through a trial situation, a qualifiers. Yeah. That there's a big lesson for the WSL today. Let me ask you this. What do you think about the WSL's leadership? The leadership, the leadership of the WSL, which which regime, right now. Well, um, I mean, first and foremost, Paul Speaker thinking that surfing is like the NFL, and the the way that they've just abused the trust of all of the photographers and everything, and banned them from the events and all this sort of stuff. You know, the heavy-handed control of that, and then you bring in. Uh, Sophie, bless her heart, yeah. the woman 
English person tennis player rugby executive to run pro surfing. Like that surely is one of the most genius moves <laughs> in the history of sport. Right. I mean, how could you fail? <laughs> and then, so you now Eric Logan, you know, comes in and um, who's, you know, he's an been, stand up paddler. He's been dealt a pretty tough hand. I mean, regardless of who it is in, in regards to this pandemic. Well, the, pa the pandemic, uh, they changed the tour. And to me, I see the pandemic as an opportunity. I do too. Because let's get something straight here. The tour the WSL running is running is the tour that I started in 1983. How, explain that. It's the countries, it's the spread, the regional offices in those countries, it's computer scoring. Um, Stokes, I got the um, a Huntington Beach programmer, um, oh, what's his name, Jeff Stokes, to program computer scoring. I put the priority rule in place at the, the OP Pro in 1983. The international judging panel to standardize worldwide judging, I put in place in 1983 with the ASP. All of the, uh, the, the I brought Brazil onto the tour, I brought Europe onto the tour in, in my time and made an international tour. So all of these things are the bedrock of WSL, but it was 1983. Do you think that you don't get enough credit for this? Oh, I'm not looking for, for credit because I like to contribute for, to things moving on. Yeah. And um, the, and I'd be happy to contribute to things moving on, but the first thing you do is I ran big events, yeah. right? And it was my company and we didn't need if we didn't make it break even at least. Yeah. And so I understand event operation. You've got to be a genius to break even when you run when you're an event operator. So to take over the events and own them is like dumb. To take over all of the major QS events from indiv indiv individual promoters and make them the challenger series, and then to have a lower grade QS series that you don't own, you've just, you've just assumed more risk right. and more complexity. And then you have a front office that's full of ultra talented and high level, highly paid people. Um, you're operating a 1983 business model in the world of sport where the world of sport has evolved and changed to where now there's the NFL network. And they're, you know, still, I mean, Amazon is, and Apple are, are doing NFL show. Like yeah. the world has changed, dude. Don't be running a 1983 product right. and be bummed that you can't make a, a solid business out of it. Yeah. Right, you've got to just reinvent. So, do you, are you suggesting that 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 Dirk Ziff is not being uh, maybe not holding onto the reins tight enough, and he's just letting these guys over here do their thing, and whatever happens, happens. Well, because I, I mean, he's the purse string. So, if we're going to talk business, who's responsible for it? I, I guess the buck stops with him. Well, yeah, of course, and you know, clearly they've made a lot of money after they got their inheritance. Right. Uh, so, uh, you know, but you I, assume he's a smart business guy. And every time, like, it's, it, well, you get a new regime come in yeah. and they go, okay, well, here's what it was in the last group of people. And here's what we're going to change. And here's the revenue projections. And here's our cost. What's the PL, right? Yeah. Like, come on. Yeah. Well, first and foremost, I think Sophie got screwed by them taking over the Kelly Slater Wave Company. Right. And regardless of how amazing that one wave is, the yeah. right is, you know, like a pretty fun wave. Oh, yeah. But when you have one wave every four minutes and, um, you know, Wave Garden is churning out a thousand waves an hour, yeah. um, your business model doesn't stack up. 
And that's been proven with the adoption of American wave machines and wave garden machines yeah. um, around the world. So the so Thomas Later Wave Company is just not economic as a business proposition. So are you saying because that was that was thrown onto Sophie's PL that put her in a bad spot? I, no. I think that it was inevitable that she would fail yeah. because it was the Kelly Slater Wave Company and the WSL. Right. And when the when the Japanese came during the Founders Cup and chose not to put the Olympics in the Kelly Slater Wave Company pool. That was done. Yeah. And you know, what they should have, and I know that they're selling days for a 50 grand, blah, blah, yeah. blah. And you make, but the, yeah. the concept that that's going to be the bedrock. I mean, the only person that could actually make that worthwhile is Charles Schwab's son. Which is, at, they're doing it. Here in Palm Springs. Yeah, and they're doing that, right? And it's, yeah, but it's not flying in Australia. Oh, no, of course not. No, no. Uh, because they're up against, you know, there is no enclave of billionaires where you can no. just fly in. Like you, you're putting, you want to put that in the Sunshine Coast, in the wetlands, um, and take jobs away from people at surf shops at the beach. I don't think so. Right. So, so, but back to my original question about the current regime. Um, how do you think they're doing? How do you? What's your overall take on night on the year 2000 and, 2021? And the World Surf League, what they're going through. I'm sure you're following everything that they're doing. Look, the the World Surf League, first and foremost, it's saddled with a business model that's 1983. Yeah, right. we add some digital stuff in there and blah blah blah. But you know, if you're such a, a content genius, then you'd be churning out content that people love to watch. What WSL show do you watch? just the pro events if the waves are pumping right all of the digital product that they generate i don't watch yeah because it's not interesting yeah because uh, their latest show is in in attempt to get over their vanilla content is you know ross williams and uh Mick. Know, and um Mick Mick. yeah being controversial they're both shills for the same system. Yeah. Like throw me in there and I'll fucking sling some mud that will create <laughs> some controversy. Hey, uh, look, th what they're doing is what me and my co-host have been doing on my other podcast for eight years. And we don't have to worry about the WSL much as you're saying here. You would be a great podcast guy for this. We, oh. we would we'd be throwing it around, man. Oh, totally. We'd be we'd be so pitching and and there'd be blood in the streets and people would be hating on us and yes. people would be loving on us. Yes. And, and I had this conversation with a, um, a content producer that's very successful, whom I won't name. Yeah. And he just goes, dude, you need to have black hats and white yes. hats. Absolutely. Right. This is the formula for Louis L'Amour. It's a formula for Westerns. Yeah. And you can't have two white hats no. talking about vanilla ice cream when your audience wants fucking chocolate ice cream. Well, look, the, that, we've got, yeah, that's go the problem. Yeah, I agree, I agree with you. They're, they're, in my opinion, the WSL has one primary principle motivation and that's to crown world champions. And to do that, they need to produce contests with the greatest surfers in the world and the greatest waves in the world. And that's what they should be focusing on. Right, and they, so, It's genius and miraculous that in this time that they've put two events in New South Wales and two in Western Australia. Is it though? I don't think it is. We, I think that's yet to be determined. Newcastle, I'm not going to watch the top 32 grovel and four foot onshore Newcastle. I don't give a shit. I can watch well, really great edits on YouTube of guys at Pipeline yesterday. Yeah, well, and he, here you go is that I competed in Newcastle, con Newcastle contests and it was the laughing stock of com competitions in Australia. Uh, I had a contest at, at Merriweather Beach where you couldn't paddle out 50 or well, 20 feet from the beach. It was that big and that closed out, which if you have a southerly buster, which is probable in that time frame, it can, it's either going to be 40 feet white water <laughs> 
<laughs> or two foot, just like every QS event that they've run at Merriweather for the last fucking five years. Exactly. This sound, now, this smells like a QS. This whole these four events sound like a QS. Even Margaret Rivers was a QS, wasn't it? Margaret River was, but. Margaret River, they just had a sailboard event last weekend. It was 20 feet. Yeah. Send them out 20 feet. But, but what happened was North Point was, was washing it? through. There oh, would wow. be a day where at North Point, it's 10 to 12 feet. It would yeah. be the best day of pro surfing in the history of pro surfing. Right. It's the best wave without question. Oh, yeah. Without so, question. But so we've, yeah. So go you got the box. So you've got that. Um, let's say else? Margaret Riv Margaret Rivers is a success. Let's say of the four, Margaret Rivers, okay, we'll give it to you. That's going to be a success if swell pending. Nairbeen, Newcastle, and Rottnest Island, that's should should they just scrape this whole year and start again in December of 2021 with the, the next season? Here's what I would have done. I would have done, we went to pipeline, we got our arts handed to us. Uh, because of COVID restrictions. Um, I'm someone in Australia looking at the final photographs of the awards show, and there's no one on the beach in front of them. Yeah, this is all our COVID bubble. But behind the fence, 100 yards up the beach, it's 10,000 people screaming. There's a COVID event occurring up the beach there oh, yeah. that no one on the North Shore is stoked about. And for sure that why why do you think sunset got cancelled yeah because their COVID bubble didn't work exactly and so now when you're going to go to merriweather and you have all of these guys everyone from 100 yards south of sydney to the gold coast is going to be in a COVID bubble outside the fenced area trying to watch the surf contest and so the only thing you'll get to watch is this but the probability is that there will be a COVID event surrounding that event and Western Australia will just pull the curtain again. Yes. Because Western Australia succeeded by banning everyone from everywhere. Yes. And, exactly. and that is the status of the mindset in Australia. Why do, you why, do you, why do you think that Victoria didn't allow them to go to Bells? Because behind the scenes, I bet there's been massive fuck ups with the Australian Open tennis. Exactly. There was there was some positives there for sure. And that's way more easy to control than a Yeah, beach. you've got a big fence. Yeah. Every, you know, just go and watch TV. Yeah. You've got stadiums. So what did they do? They had problems, so they booted everyone out. They shut down Melbourne, yet they still allowed this event to happen as a TV event. Yeah. But the people in Melbourne are just going, dude, we can't risk this. Yeah. The so people in Queensland are going, no, no one's coming across our border. So your feeling is that it's it's going to be a it's going to be a fail. I, my feeling is that at best, it's 50 50. Yeah. I, you know, what I, what I feel as an Australian, I'm stoked to have surfing uh, Australia representing as the surf capital of the world. Yeah. I'm stoked that New South Wales stepped up and provided this opportunity. I'm stoked that WA has stepped up and Rottnest can be really good. Like yeah. it, it's it's like Lois, yeah. the wave they're going to hold it at. And kind of sharky kind of, though, right? Sharky? Oh, dude. Massive sharks. Oh my God, are you kidding me? Yeah. You're, you're on the continental shelf. Yeah. Before, before there was this massive explosion of great whites, there were great whites there. Exactly. That's now what, what you got is the great whites eating great whites. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm tuning yeah, but, in. I'm going to tune in for that one. <laughs> yeah, but my mate Perry Hatchett used to yeah. be the head judge. He's yeah. Water Patrol Australia. He'll be he'll be driving the jet skis around with a shotgun. Go, oh, <laughs> he will dive off with a fucking knife in his mouth. That's that's how, look, that's how they are in WA, mate. That's great. It I is. It. Yeah, it's it's, and I. My heart of hearts, I hope they succeed. Yeah. I would, I really hope they would succeed. Yeah. But my rational mind goes, um, fear of COVID 
fear of a breakout, the fact that their response is shut down. Yeah. Tennis is too big. Yeah. Surfing, you can just pull the plug and no one gives a shit. Yeah, exactly. And if that occurs, what happens to the ELO regime? Well, I'm glad this is a great segue because this is going to be my last question for you. Um, I'm of the opinion that eventually this thing goes away. Uh, maybe it's this year, maybe it's in five years. At some point, Dirk Ziff just goes, okay, we've had enough, you know, whatever. We're, we're out. And pro surfing is left. There's a void now. And I've put out the opinion on my other show that, that I believe that Australia should run professional surfing. And, and I think that we should decentralize the whole thing. In other words, you could run the North American version of it. Um, let's say Barton or whoever runs it, whoever it is, runs it in Australia. There's a couple of guys that run it in Hawaii. Maybe it's Ross Williams and, and, and Marty or whoever. There's guys in Brazil that run their little thing. And we've got, say, six or seven decentralized groups that run their national surf pro surfing. And then we all get together at one place for the quote unquote, you know, finale. Why don't we make the finale Sunset Haleiwa and Pipeline? I'm with you. I'm fine with that. Oh, I'm fine with that. I know. And it sounds like 1973 again, which is great. But do you think that that's what do you think happens after this iteration of the of pro surfing goes away? Does it decentralize? Is it smart for it to decentralize? Or should we Look. have one big head honcho guy somewhere what what will happen is that surfing will will readjust and 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 have a look at the um who is title of a couple of these events in australia um uh, hurley no yes, the sir. cities the municipalities well it's the states right the maybe states. the cities but rip curl oh rip curl yeah right exactly but, right but they're actually title of three of them I know, but they must be getting it for free. Well, for, for cheap, but having the kudos of having Rip Curl involved yeah. is very important. And who did that? Claw? Claw. Yeah. Doug Warbrick. Yeah. So regardless of what happens with these guys, surfers will be buying board shorts and wetsuits. Exactly. And people that really matter, like Claw, uh, like some people in Brazil, like other people in Australia, they'll, they'll step up and there will be something that, yeah, will but, adjust, that will adjust to the realities of the time. Right. But that's, you're not, you're, you're, you're being too general. I want you to be more specific. Do you think we will decentralize and these five or six national bodies will get together on the North shore of Oahu in, in the year 2024 and have a triple crown? Um, Structurally, it'd be pretty easy to do that. It's very inexpensive. You make each of the people in each of their regions, um, you know, they, they have to um, earn enough money to pay their salary. It's just like how the ASP was set up. And then you would have a, a group that would sanction those events and you would have some sort of um, uh, joint rule book that everyone would operate under. And people yeah. would try, it will go back. And let me tell you, every, every season would have a trials yeah. where anyone could enter. And so then you could have a 1990 scenario where Tom Caram wins the world title from the from the trials, Epic. and you know, could be that be um, what's his name Maniz from uh, Costa Rica, Carlos, Carlos. Yeah, I mean he's a great surfer. He's easily good enough. He's proven in pipeline, well, small wave aerial. He's he's like that multi-talented guy that just couldn't couldn't. Um, he might not have had the willingness that you spoke well, of earlier. Yeah, perhaps he didn't have the mental skills, but certainly had the surfing skills. Yeah, well, well, they, all, they all do. Yeah, there's, there's something. The world of surfing has proven that it's just going to be cruise along as the world of surfing with or without the WSL. I agree, but it almost sounds like at some point we start to step on Fernando's toes a little bit. We start to step on the ISA's toes if we decentralize and have these nation states come together because there's no real amateur professional um, you know, line of demarcation. So well, I speak. don't think it's the, um, 
I think there's a difference between the professional sport and the objectives of, of ISA. I personally feel the ISA has the international network. They have the connection to the Olympics. So the Olympics is sort of like the Holy Grail, but um, you know, they, they, they have a part ownership in the Association of Paddleboarding Professionals. So they've already uh, stepped in and, and created a bit of a, you know, a, a collaboration model with APP and ISA. Yeah. yeah. And there's yeah. a really good opportunity that um, builds on the back of their international network. You could create exactly what you're talking about. Exactly. That's... And it's, it's sort of a bit like a slam dunk. And it is. You know, suddenly the, the money that's being asked of Claw and Rep Curl and of Billabong and stuff, they, they throw in a bit of kitty. You get some local government help and boom, you know, you're away again. So yeah. um, do, we, do we need, you know, the, the, the big offices? And the high-powered salaries, and do we really, really need the the um, hugely expensive webcast when you, know, you can do it for one tenth the cost? Yeah, um, and maybe it's not full net, network ready, but it's good enough for us. Exactly. I mean, yeah, we're we're kind of simple guys. Yeah, and you know, we're just happy to see that stuff, and and maybe they can throw some people on as commentators that are going to say fuck and that are exactly. going to call bullshit when obviously it's bullshit. Exactly. And that, that's what we want. And, you know, the, the lack of recognition that the actual most important um, user base for the WSL is all of us, yeah. all of the surfers around the world is sort of like full Hollywood myopia beyond, beyond concept. Yeah. And, you know, so there's a, there's a massive audience of surfers that just want to get recognized as surfers again. And they want, they want that, that group of people to speak to them, just yeah. like we can speak to surfers. Like I can, I can go anywhere in the world, and just be friends with surfers. Yeah. Yeah. That's. What do you and, think and of that's, Those you, guys can't. What do you think of Pat O'Connell stepping down? It could be argued that he was sort of the last salt well, in the building, so to speak. And first, first and foremost, the role that he was given as tour manager. Yeah, it's toxic because you've got to support the machine against the individual. Yeah, over and over and over again until ultimately everyone hates you. Yeah, and Pat O'Connell is not the kind of guy. He's he's <laughs> he's everyone's friend. Exactly, and that's his personality. Yeah, he was the wrong person for that job. You got to have some fucking asshole like me just going. I don't give a fuck, John. John, who the, who you think you are? You fucking blew it. You're out of here. Right. Who is that person? I'm oh, thinking. I don't just, know. What like about Jake, Jake? Jake Patterson. Oh, Jake Patterson would be awesome for that. Yeah, I think so and, too. Yeah, he's he's a total dickhead. Perfect <laughs> for the job. But the other thing is that Jake Patterson won the Pipe Masters. Exactly. He's a real surfer. Absolutely. And he says it, tells it like it is. I love the guy for that. So that kind of respect that he has yes. won't get completely eroded. People would be pissed, but they can't take away from Jake Patterson exactly. what he's done. Yeah. Right. In the end, you just got to go, okay, sorry, Jake. And, you know, all right. It's hard to make a short list for that job. I mean, I thought of Jake Patterson and then I'm stymied to come up with somebody besides you uh, you know, that's got the, all of what it takes, you know, like if I was at like Barton kind of comes to mind, like I think Barton could be the commissioner, but Barton's almost maybe too nice for that role. Yeah. I, I don't think he would like it, but Barton as an analyst. Excellent. Excellent. I mean, Kelly is an analyst. Barton is an analyst. Like yeah. we're talking about someone that sees, I, I don't want someone to tell me, what I see, I want to want someone to explain why it happened, and what could, what else could have happened. What was he thinking? Did he make was make a mistake by take, taking that wave, and he missed a set? Like you miss a set in a heat, it's a massive error. Yeah, right. I want to. I want someone to tell me that. Like that's yeah. a bad move. And yeah, yeah. There's like the um, John McEnroe model in tennis broadcasting, where John McEnroe tells it like it is, and everyone goes, "Thank you for that." Oh, completely. And it, that right there is part of the essence of change that needs to occur 
that will not occur because you've got you're being controlled by a massive onset of political correctness that i, I mean eric logan i mean i i can't get into political correctness yeah just trust it you know i think that's been proven <laughs> so but we my group of the in the surfers in the world are not politically correct we we like to fucking rag on each other and if you can't handle a decent ragging then you're a pussy and you need to fuck off and it but it's all in fun and it's all part of the family you know what i'm saying I hear you. I hear you. hey i remember uh, i was surfing with the out at swamis probably 20 years ago you dropped in on me. I went, what the fuck? And you looked out at me and, and I think we kicked out and you basically said, mate, there's three waves. There's 75 people. I'm fucking going. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Yeah. I'm just going to, um, on one that, that special day when I will go across past Swami's on my stand up paddle board. Yeah. Across to the next wave up there, I can't never remember the name. The boneyards. 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 I'll ride a few waves, and on the way back, I will time it for like the biggest set of the day, right? And I'll be way out, so I'll stroke into that thing, boom, boom, ride that thing. Everyone fucking screaming at me all the way. Get the barrel on the inside section into the sand, and just go. Thank you very much. I'm looking for you, Ian Cairns. I'm looking for you. <laughs> That'd be so fun. Oh, Lordy. Well, look, this was a great conversation. I, I really appreciate chatting with you. I've taken an hour and a half of your time here. And uh, I look forward to perhaps doing it again sometime, Ian. You're always a great interview. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's so much. And there's so much that's going to happen over these next three or four months. Yeah. So, you know, questions will be answered. Yep. Um, I don't think the, the final question will be answered. But... I mean, it's, it's going to be, it's a very, very interesting time. Uh, and I kind of look at disaster as an opportunity. Yeah. To be, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, you know, because there's, um, I, I personally like to wake up in the morning and, and I've already brushed off yesterday. Yeah. And I, I, the sun comes up, you know, I can, I stand up and I go vertical and I go, wow, you know, some cool shit's going to happen today. Yeah. And that, yeah. that's the, the world I want to live in. Yeah. Good. I think I hear the doorbell ring, and I think Matt Young's the waiting there at the door. <laughs> oh, he's, he's got a fucking six pack. And I'm going, you have to go back to the market, mate, because we need a dozen. Exactly. It's true. <laughs> All right, Ian. Well, thank you, buddy. I appreciate it. Good uh, stuff. Good see stuff. You, mate. All right. Cheers. Bye.